Welcome back. In my last videos, I gave you a brief overview of the Kishoten Ketsu, or Japanese forex structure, and dove deeper into some of the particulars of the style. Today, I'll give you a few examples from some popular anime. I'll also show you how Kishoten Ketsu can be weaved into a Western three-act framework with your secondary characters. Let's get into it. Each of these anime can be found on Netflix, YouTube, or almost any other streaming service that serves anime, so you should be able to easily follow along. To research this video, I re-watched some episodes of my favorite anime. Sitting down and watching all that excellent anime was a burden, but for you, it's a sacrifice I'm willing to make. Don't say I never do anything for you. Much of Kishoten Ketsu is based on folklore and urban legends. These themes are so pervasive they appear in urban legends from all over the world, not just Asia. If you want a quick read before my deep dive examples, I suggest you google an urban legend called The Licked Hand. This little urban legend is only a few paragraphs long, and follows Kishoten Ketsu to a T. It's also worthy of note that the same things that make a good Kishoten Ketsu also make good comedy. Every joke, like Kishoten Ketsu, relies on an introduction, build-up, and a twist that reframes what came before. The audience participates in the conclusion or the ketsu of the joke by either laughing or not. Let's look at one quickly. Two men are sitting on a bench and one says to the other, I know a man with a wooden leg named Smith. The other man looks shocked and intrigued. Oh really? The other man said. What did he name his other leg? So at the risk of making a joke unfunny by explaining it, let's make this joke unfunny by explaining it. First, we have the introduction or the key. Two men are sitting on a bench. Next, we have the build-up or the show. And one says to the other, I know a man with a wooden leg named Smith. The other man looks shocked and intrigued. We end the joke with the twist or the ten. Oh really? What did he name the other leg? The conclusion or the ketsu is up to the audience. They either find it funny or not. If it's funny, then great. Hilarity and mirth have ensued for all. If not... They're probably watching a Saturday Night Live skit. But back to the point, the most prolific source of Kishoten Ketsu that most people have access to in the West is anime and manga. Since most of it's from Japan or Korea, it's the purest form of the style we have, and you can get it almost anywhere. Netflix, Amazon Prime, YouTube, streaming services like Crunchyroll or Funimation, I think even Disney has a few titles to check out. So you could pick any show and check the style out for yourself if you like. But be sure to get authentic anime or manga ported from releases in Japan or Korea. Anime has become hugely popular in the West and there are a lot of copycats out there. Avatar, The Last Airbender, or Totally Spies are good examples of Western shows that are influenced by anime and manga. They look similar, but they're based on Western storytelling techniques and not Kishoten Ketsu. The Promised Neverland. My first example is from a show you can find on Netflix called The Promised Neverland. I'll take my example from episode 1 of the series. Fair warning, this show deals with some disturbing themes. You may want to skip ahead if that bothers you. And in case you hadn't guessed, spoilers abound. The story follows a group of children at the Gracefield Orphanage. We open with a scene of three of the children standing in front of an ominous iron gate. They're staring down a long, dimly lit corridor. The first act is about 12 to 13 percent of the show, and that's not a lot of time. In a 22 minute anime, that's only about two and a half minutes. You might think that's not enough time to convey any meaningful plot or character development, but in the hands of a master storyteller, it's more than enough. Here's the exposition we learn in the first minute of the show. We learn that they're orphans, they grew up in the orphanage and may have been born there, they've never been to the outside world, they're never to go near the gate or to the outside world because it's dangerous. They're being cared for by someone named Mother, who can't be their real mother since they're all orphans. Ray's character is skeptical about what he's been told. Emma's character is curious and optimistic about this discovery. And an unnamed boy in the scene is wary and thinks there's more to it than they're being told. I also count the opening of the show as part of the first act. I think this is why anime openings tend to change frequently compared to Western media. They act as part of the first act and change as the characters and plot develop through the series. Here's what we learn from the opening's next minute and a half. 
We learn who the three main characters are, that they're being held down by some form of darkness. We see the orphanage. We see ravens flying in the distance, symbols of death. We learn more about the personalities of the main characters, that Emma's emotional, cheerful, and energetic. Norman's intelligent and calculating. Ray is tough as nails and aloof. Images of the other children in the orphanage show that they seem to be happy and well-adjusted, but barcodes on their neck evoke images of concentration camps. We see images of the bubbly, cheerful Emma seeming sullen for some reason. We see Mother Isabella and Sister Corona, who seem to genuinely care for the children. The image of a barred window shows that the children may be more captive than they know. We have what looks like our three main characters forming a secret alliance for some purpose. A burning fuse indicates that there's a time limit until some important event happens. A scene of our heroes running through the forest indicates a flight from something. A shot through a chain-link fence evokes even more prison imagery. We have another shot of our heroes dressed all in white, which is a sign of purity and innocence. Our final shot is of the heroes breaking through a wall. It rains puzzle pieces around them, indicating a mystery to be solved. Frequent butterfly imagery throughout the intro express a desire for freedom. In intellectual circles, this is what we call a cubic mega buttload of information. As you can see, a skilled storyteller can introduce an impressive amount of exposition and story in a short amount of time. I won't go into this much depth with my other examples. I only wanted to show you how much exposition a skilled hand can cram into a few short minutes. In the development, we get more world building. As with Western media, the second act takes about 50% of the running time. In a 22 minute anime, that will pull us in at about 10 to 11 minutes. From what we see in this act, you would almost think this is a typical slice of life anime. The children play, go to school, and do chores. They seem to be very well adjusted and cared for. They're very close and treat each other more like family than wards in an orphanage. I've never been to an orphanage, but if you're going to be in one, this looks like the one to be in. Now we start the third act. In a 22 minute anime, the third act is about 5.5 minutes long. 25% of the runtime of the show. This is where the big twist happens and what the story's all about. And remember, it should be a hard twist. Don't waste your big reveal. We're guiding our characters through a process of discovery, not following a roadmap to buried treasure. The twist doesn't need to happen right at the 13 minute mark. We've laid the foundations in Act 1, established the world and lore in Act 2, and now we build toward the payoff. The actual reveal won't happen until about halfway or so through the act. The twist in this episode comes when one of the children, Connie, is adopted out of the orphanage. She leaves her favorite stuffed bunny behind, and two of the characters, Emma and Norman, rush to get it back to her. When they get to the front gate of the orphanage, where the children aren't allowed to approach, they find Connie isn't being adopted out at all. She's being sold as food to a trio of horrifying demons. They aren't in an orphanage, they're on a farm and they aren't being adopted, they're being raised as pigs for slaughter. This is what the story is all about. This is the movie poster moment for the anime. Let's look at one poster for the show. We see our three main characters. Emma Ray and Norman are illuminated by a lamp in the foreground. The lamp in Norman's hand represents the truth they've discovered which has reframed the story. They're standing on a dinner plate calling out the fact that the children are being raised for slaughter. The plate has clock numbering on its face, and the fork and knife on the plate resemble the hands of a clock. This indicates the time constraint they're all under. The children are all adopted out by the age of 12, and Emma's already 11. The children are under what appears to be a cloche, a domed covering used to display meals in restaurants. In the silvery face of the cloche, we can see the gate reflected in its surface. The other children stand on plates of their own with their backs to the heroes. This indicates they're oblivious to the danger they're in. We're into the fourth act, revealed the twist, and now it's time for the characters to react to what they've seen. The characters must remain in character for the scenes that follow. Emotional characters should remain emotional, logical characters should remain logical, aloof characters should remain aloof. Their actions should flow from their established character traits. This act is another 10-12% to of the story and takes another 2.5 minutes of runtime. This is where the children react to the discovery they've just made and begin making escape plans. Ah, my goddess. I think you can find this anime on Funimation, and I know you can find episodes on YouTube. 
This anime focuses on Keiichi Morisato, a student at the Nakomi Institute of Technology. In the first episode, we begin with an opening narration that sets the world. This is also an interesting opening to study since the narration directly references fate and principles of determinism much anime is based on. As a refresher for those who haven't seen my last video on the Kishoten Ketsu method, determinism is the worldview that we don't bend the world to our will, rather the world bends us to its will. Characters in a story written from a deterministic framework are reactive and driven by the plot instead of proactively driving the plot. We see Keiichi start his day and are introduced to his world and the people who share it with him. The development comprises the next 10 minutes or so of the show. Again, this is where we get more character development and world building. This is a slice of Keiichi's life. We see his school, his club, his friends and classmates, even his zodiac sign. We learn he's constantly consumed by bad luck, a pushover who's taken advantage of by his clubmates, and he wants a girlfriend. It's important to note here that there hasn't been a call to action yet. The first act was laying the foundation for the rest of the story, and the second act was all character development and exposition. It helps to remember that this structure isn't like ticking off plot points on a list. It's more like a process of discovery, as we meet the characters and discover their world with them. Now we have the twist. Remember, it's a hard twist. Go big or go home. We close the second act with a glimpse into the celestial realm, where an angelic being is working on a kind of heavenly computer. Prompted by an act of kindness to a little girl Keiichi met on the street, the angelic being appears to him and introduces herself as the goddess Beldandi. Because of his kind spirit, she offers to grant him one wish to turn his bad luck around. This episode concludes in an atypical way. Instead of closing on an event or emphasis, it closes on another narration from the divine narrator at the start of the episode. The conclusion is also shorter than most at only one minute long, but it does follow a couple of the typical tropes of the style. First, it leaves the audience in suspense. This is sacrilege in Western media, but common in Kishoten Ketsu. We don't know what Keiichi will do with his one wish. Instead, we're left with an image of him cowering in a corner as the goddess stands before him. Second, the fourth act overlaps slightly with the third. As I said in my last video, Kishoten Ketsu seems to be a bit fuzzy to me. By that, I mean it's malleable and adaptable to the needs of the author. It's not about hitting standard beats and checking scenes off a list as with Western media. Rather, it's more like guiding your characters through a process of discovery. Our final anime example comes from One Piece, which you can find on Netflix or Funimation. You could probably find it on YouTube too. One Piece follows Monkey D. Luffy and his crew as he sails the seas to become the King of the Pirates. Our example comes from episode 98 in season 4. This anime opens as many do, with a spot of narration summing up the previous episodes. We learn a bit about the history of the Kingdom of Arabasta and the role Luffy and his crew are playing in their civil war. During the show, we experience more character development and world building. We meet the Barbar Sand Pirates and their navigator Rasa who travel the desert on a massive sand crawling pirate ship. We also learn that Luffy's crewmates Nami and Princess Vivi have been kidnapped by the Sand Pirates. Rasa is also standoffish and hostile toward Vivi for some unknown reason. We also get another taste of Eastern determinism. The leader of the Sand Pirates says he will never do anything to defy the flow of the sand when his crew suggests abandoning their damaged vessel. Most of the episode is devoted to Luffy, Vivi, and Rasa traveling to the Mariasu Oasis to find materials to fix the broken ship. In the twist, we see that the Oasis used to be a thriving city, but it's been swallowed by the desert. More importantly, we learn the reason Rasa hates Princess Vivi. Several years before, her father, the king, visited the town and promised never to turn his back on them. After the desert started encroaching on the town, the townspeople waited for the king to return and fulfill his promise. The king never showed, and the town started to die. Eventually, Rasa was the only person left waiting for a king who would never come. In the conclusion, we get a tearful reconciliation between Vivi and Rasa. We also see Rasa coming to terms with her past. The episode ends with Luffy, Vivi, and Rasa bringing back a load of lumber to fix the ship. This anime breaks form in that it has a fair amount of conflict. Much anime doesn't, and it's unusual for a story plotted in the Kishoten Ketsu method. 
but it can happen and in this anime it does. This may help to explain the popularity of this anime in the West. At times, it seems to combine the both of best worlds. It has the world building and hard twist of a traditional Kishoten Ketsu with the conflict and romantic stoicism of Western media. A recurring theme that dominates this anime is Luffy's indomitable spirit and his desire to overcome every obstacle in his path. No matter what obstacle stands in his way, he's determined to become the king of the pirates. As I stated in my last video, there's also a case to be made for giving characters in Western media a Kishoten Ketsu arc. Let's take a look at Star Wars A New Hope and see how that looks. This example focuses on Han and Chewie's role in the movie. Since we're only dealing with Han and Chewie, we'll pick up from the beginning of Act 2. This is after the inciting incident and call to action, but when Han and Chewie are introduced. We'll treat their contribution as a standalone story. In the introduction, we start with Han and Chewie minding their own business in the Moss Eisley Cantina, looking for new work. Then, a cloaked stranger and some wide-eyed kid step into the bar and approach them for a fare. They accept and are immediately thrust into the action and need to escape the spaceport under Imperial fire. The rest of Han and Chewie's act of the story revolves around them delivering the pair of strangers to Alderaan. They deliver the strangers to Alderaan, but it's gone. Only a massive debris field in its place. The ship approaches a small moon for a safe place to land, only to discover it's not a moon. It's a planet-sized floating citadel. Han and Chewie discover the strangers are part of a rebel alliance on a mission to rescue a princess held in the citadel. Han and Chewie find themselves sucked into a galactic civil war as they don stormtrooper uniforms to rescue the princess and escape the citadel. During the conclusion, they get their money and storm off, but Han is changed by the journey. He returns at the final hour to help the Rebellion destroy the Death Star. These were just a few examples of the Kishoten Ketsu method. From the exceptions I highlighted, you can see it's quite malleable. I think the important thing to remember is it's about the journey, not the destination. We need to guide our characters through a process of discovery and watch them deal with the aftermath. Some people in the West have a problem with determinism in literature. Ayn Rand is particularly vocal on this point. She considers determinism to be downright evil, and I'm not even exaggerating on that. But I think this is misguided. There's a place for determinism in Western media. Everyone loves a story about the knight who slays the dragon and gets the girl. But the world isn't always within our grasp. Sometimes things just happen and all we can do is cope. It's time to add a little determinism to our diets. Instead of the gallant knight and glinting steel, perhaps it's time to focus on the young farmer and his wife striving desperately to stay ahead of the dragon's breath. Whatever your opinion, the Kishoten Ketsu method is there if you're in the mood to try something new. That's it for this episode. Good writing, and Calamus Gladio Fortior.